the top row there is going out to one second, and the bottom row is with this order going out to six seconds. So again, pay attention to those time scales as you think about other people's experiments. So this is no disorder. This is just watching this gas sort of, um, there's this weak disorder, sorry, just kind of diffuse away. And this is an example where there's very strong disorder. Now it's six seconds, there's still a remnant there of localized atoms, all right? Okay, and um, here they're showing uh, for two different disorder strengths, weaker and stronger disorder, the sort of size of the gas squared um, versus time, okay? And how this gas, and this is the size of the component which diffuses away slowly. There's a localized component present, and if you squint, you can see there's a haze here. You see the same thing, and um, that's the diffusion of, um, of that part. And the reason they plot the size squared versus time is this is a diffusion curve. Right? That's what diffusion looks like. Okay, so the interpretation of these results was that this is 3D, there's a mobility edge present. So, you know, my group, we had a distribution of energies, and so that mobility edge lies somewhere in the distribution of energies. So some of the atoms are localized, those are those, we've got ones. And some of the atoms are free to diffuse away, and those are the ones here in a haze, which eventually disappear, and that's what's happening in this experiment as well. Okay, so that's the interpretation of, of the basic observation, yeah. These, uh, in your experiment, you mm -hmm. um, the is near near There's no lattice here. There's no lattice, but can you, the kinetic energy, the, I mean, the dynamics of atoms. Right, they're, they're like free atoms, like P squared over 2 m. Okay. Both cases. I like that. So these are like just free atoms. You know, p squared over 2m, that gets renormalized. It to some extent must be by the disorder, right? So you calculate the self energy here, you yeah. find that, you know. I'm trying to think in the language of the lattice, that will be somewhat similar to a near or something? I don't think it's anything like that. Okay. okay, there's not like an Anderson model here you should apply to the system. This okay. is like a bulk disorder system. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. In, in this graph, the last one, uh, this is only diffusion, right? When yeah. square is proportional to mm -hmm. T. Um, but this is the... So there's, no, th this is the mobile component. It's kind of hard to see in their data, but just like us, they have two components present. A mobile part, which is diffusing, and a localized part, because mobility edge cuts into an energy spectrum. Which one is the localized part? Oh, it's really hard to see in their data. Um, it's difficult to see here. Okay, these, these are just fits to the size of just the mobile component. Okay, so, you know, in our data you can kind of see it, there's this haze here, and this part kind of expands away, and this thing will sit here for a second. So that, you know, in this image, they're just fitting the expansion of this haze back here, which is diffusing away. It's just difficult to see in their images. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is what we saw too, you know, this is just looking at that localized component, and what we see is it kind of expands, it diffuses out, and then it gets stuck. And these curves are what you calculate for classical diffusion. And here you can see over some period of time this gets sucked, and we're able to eventually follow this out to a second. All right, these are the profiles. So we also saw the gas adopt along one direction, a very exponential looking profile. Question? Yeah. Uh, so that red curve that you're trying to fit, is that uh, parallel to T squared? Okay, so to say a little bit, uh, oh, this? Yeah, th that, that's what that is. It's not fit. I actually just use, this is totally constrained. I just calculated cal classical diffusion and speckled potential using our atoms. And this is what would happen if they were diffusing without quantum corrections. Yeah. So it looks like it's not T squared. It's not, uh, maybe it's like super diffusion or something. Yeah, it might be doing something like that at short times until it seems to get stuck. Right. right. So it's not diffusion, so what is it? Well, I don't know. This is one of the things which I think is kind of interesting in, in something which should be studied in more detail is the dynamics of how things localize, right? I mean, it's not something you've really been talked about before these experiments, but it's something you see when you watch actually. It's complicated interference forming, if you want to think about aerosol localization that way. And the localized component, if I understand correctly, is like the black dot. No, th these are actually, sorry, I think I wasn't intending to go into a lot of detail here. Um, these are the sizes along two different directions of the gas. So there's the long direction of the gas. What we see is along the long size of the speckle, we get a long exponential wave. <coughs> and along this direction, um, we see something quite small that never really changes from the size of the trap much. So this thing basically gets stuck at the size of the trap and never expands at all. And along the long direction of the speckle, the gas seems to expand really rapidly and then gets stuck. So those are just two, the two directions of the gas. And remember that speckle has quite an anisotropic 
size. In fact, the characteristic size is six times longer along the direction of propagation than along the transverse direction. And that affects the localization lengths that are present. So here what's happening is our understanding is that the localization lengths are much smaller than the initial size of the gas. The gas is so strongly localized, so you simply don't ever see anything happen. And here, the gas, and what happens here is that the gas, the localization length that will occur in the localized regime is longer than the size of the gas. So it needs to go out and sample all that speckle and then eventually dynamically, you know, interfere with itself and localize. And that process is interesting, right, but not something which people really spend a lot of time thinking about. But we can measure it. Yeah? So I guess I have a question about that procedure. So you're loading the atoms into the trap mm -hmm. with no speckle, then you turn the speckle on? We, in our experiment, we slowly turn the speckle on, and then we turn the trap off and let them go. So, so the atoms don't see this potential until you let it go? Yeah. Well, they do, uh, they do, right, because the speckle's everywhere, and the speckle's on top of them when they're in the trap. But apparently what's happening here is the localization length along the Z direction is longer than their initial size. So they're not localized until they go and sample it. I mean, that's what happened in the 1D experiments too, right? I mean, the 1D experiments, the guys had to expand and interfere with itself until it got out to whatever the localization length should be, and then it becomes localized, or quasi-static, or whatever is happening here, actually, because, you know, it's maybe a little bit complicated, right? So I, I think that process of what those dynamics is really interesting and something that people should think about. And it's something we can measure really well, and all the groups working on this can measure really well, but people haven't taken the time to do it because there's not a lot to compare to. We, we did a little bit. There's a paper I didn't I'm not going to talk about at all where we actually changed the length scale of the disorder and watched what happened. And we did that by um, changing the numeric, the F number of our focusing lines, which if you think about what I said yesterday, you can do that. And so we know a little bit about how this time scale changes, but there's not a lot to compare it to, right? So, you know, I don't know where to go from there. Um, but there's a paper we have from PRL that has a lot of data in it, and other groups have studied this too. Okay, so that's the kind of picture or understanding for what's happening in these 3D localization experiments. Um, these are some of the observations. Uh, like I said, we later saw this go out to seconds, and you know, it's important to keep in mind that this was observed out to many seconds. Um, both experiments also measured mobility edges, as has another group now. So what we did, for example, to measure the mobility edge in our experiment, which is basically what was done in the SPA experiment, is we always see this two-component distribution. There's some amount of atoms which are localized and some which are free to diffuse or do something. Um, and so we measured the fraction of those atoms as we varied the temperature of the gas and we know the energy distribution and the disorder. And we're able to just make a simple model saying, okay, well, it's a close to a maximal Boltzmann distribution. You know, where do I have to put the mobility edge to get that fraction? We found as all those data collapse onto a single thing, which shows us where the mobility edge versus the disorder lies. And these are data from the ESPA group um, where they were able to do a similar kind of measurement to find out what the mobility edge is doing by measuring the fraction of diffusing versus fraction of localized atoms. And the way they did it was a little complicated. It's probably not worth getting into it. Um, what they did was they looked at the central density and looked at how it saturated or stopped changing at long times. And uh, based on some analysis, inferred what that central density meant in terms of how many atoms were localized. Okay. Now, um, one thing I should mention, what's next here? Oh yeah, I think I should mention this. In fact, um, for our case with a single speckle beam, no one really, there's not a good calculation of the mobility edge yet for that single speckle beam. And there's a calculation of the mobility edge here, um, but you can see that you know, there's not complete agreement with the data yet. So there's some things here which are also um, still unknown and good problems to work on, but hard, hard problems. Because certainly all the experiments go beyond the Born approximation. And, uh, you know, so your main calculational easy tool is not entirely appropriate. Okay, so um, there's a lot of more measurements, and there's, there's tons of theory papers on localization of 1D with ultra gold atoms in speckle and for incommensurate lattices. Um, there's more measurements from Angusio's group, and there's a lot of theory in 3D speckle. And uh, challenges. Challenges are um, no one's really been able to do 2D Anderson localization yet, so no one's really observed that, and there's probably some good reasons for that. Um, the best guess why this has been impossible is, first of all, the speckle, which is the big tool we have, uh, just traps the atoms in, in 2D in any regime where um, you would not have atoms really trapped and that physics dominating or being worried by being dominated by that physics. The localization lengths are much, much bigger in any kind of calculation you do than the gas, and so it would be difficult to see it. Um, 
Uh, there's a lot of work. A lot of challenges for theory in 3D. It's just hard to calculate things for this 3D interstellar localization. And like I said, I think the dynamics of the localization is really interesting, and there's not long, a lot known theoretically about that. But there's lots of measurements. Okay, so that's kind of the story of what's been seen in Anderson localization experiments. And this is pretty clearly Anderson localization. All right, so I think we know enough. We know enough what's going on. This is Anderson localization. So any questions before I move on to something else? Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. so if you go get, read the paper in PRL, you can see that. So we know that the mobility edge has a dependence on the size scale of the speckle also. Yeah. So there's a paper in PRL. If you go search around, you'll find it um, from my group. And there's a bunch of discussion in there. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, so um, one issue with that, and most of the experiments so far, is we're working with an energy distribution. Right, so you know the mobility edge is somewhere in this energy distribution. There are atoms which are far from mobility edge, atoms which are close to the mobility edge. So you get a mix of all these behaviors going on. So I, I think Ngucho's group has come closest to trying to find a way to work around all of that and see what's happening. But I don't think anybody's doing the experiment yet where you could really find some kind of critical coefficient in terms of how things are, uh, what's happening right around the mobility edge. <coughs> You know, and then the, the additional thing you have to be cautious about here is it's really not happening, it's not having infinite time, it's not an infinite sample. Um, so I'm not really sure how much sharp behavior should be there anyway. Um, and so that's another complication. But I would say no one's really figured out how to probe the mobility edge and really, you know, we're kind of talking about this at breakfast. And really, like, the way you really like to do, which is to go and look at all the details of what the mobility edge is doing and how localization lengths are changing as energy scales get close to that. No one's really figured out how to do that yet. I think Gucci's group's moving in that direction. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm noticing uh, sort of the plots of the early one D localization versus mm -hmm. theory data is that the theory said that as the disorder was increasing, it would be kind of going to zero. But the data looked like at some point it was capping out. It's yeah. Like 0.2 million or something. Yeah, like right. So I, I think um, that was the data for the localization length in this phase experiment. Yeah, yeah there's not agreement there. Um, is there a party, reason for that? The I think there's a lot of potential reasons that you know, would be worth investigating in our papers on this. I mean, one thing is that the model of the speckle that was used to develop that theory is not correct because it used a uniformly illuminated lens. Mm -hmm. But there is no such thing as that. That's impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Because that leads to unphysical things occurring, like in the Fourier spectrum of the speckle, the spatial Fourier spectrum is a cutoff. That can't be true, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, maybe that's a problem. Maybe the, uh, I don't know. So there's all kinds of things. Um, you know, the calculations are kind of often done on a Born approximation or self-consistent yeah. Born approximation, but it's probably not really good for the experiment. Um, and so there's lots of good stuff to do there, right? And, you know, I think it's just the nature of physics, right? I mean, a lot of the easy things have been done, okay? And so there's a lot of hard, gnarly problems left. But I think they're worth doing. And the nice thing here is that the data are really clear. We know what's going on really well. We know what the disorder is. Right, so it's worthwhile digging into the dirty stuff to try to see what you can figure out because things are fairly constrained. So if you learn something in theory um, and it's well matched the experimental conditions, you really can learn something, right? And so I think it's, they're worthwhile. But I mean, yeah, just to warn you that easy problems, all the self-consistent born work's been done already, and that was just gnarly hard stuff left. Um, so. Okay, so the next topic I'm, I'm going to move on to is localization with interactions. And here's where I'm going to be a little circumspect about what's really happening here. You know, from my perspective, um, this is an old problem. It's an old problem, how does Anderson localization change if interactions are present, right? People have been talking about this for a long time. You know, MBL came along, and that's, that's some new thing, but the basic question about when we introduce atoms, inter, introduce interactions between particles that are Anderson localizing, how does it change? This is an old question. So from my point of view, all the experiments working on this um, particular problem are really interesting. And the, and the reason for that is, except in very special, special situations, we just can't calculate what's going to happen. All right? Once we introduce strong interactions between the atoms, we have disorder present, um, with some exceptions. So, so that's my point of view. And so what I'm going to do is just tell you about what has been done and what claims have been made. And I may go through this a little bit too fast, but you can try to slow me down, and, and I'll just try to hit the highlights. OK, so one of the first things I'll talk about are people who looked at the so-called <coughs> disorder of Bose Hubbard model, which I mentioned yesterday. So you take a regular Hubbard model with bosons and introduce disorder. 
Sometimes it's called the dirty boson problem. Again, this problem's been around for a long time. And it's a really key model that's kind of been useful for understanding dirty superconductors and dirty superfluids and things like that. So here's a paper I stole from, a uh, picture I stole from Angushio's group, and I forgot to give credit for that, that shows what's known about the quantum phase diagram of this system at low temperature, technically at zero temperature. And this phase diagram is now known very well um, in 1D, 2D, and actually in 3D now we know a lot about this phase diagram, but not everything. So what, what I'm showing here is a tunneling divided by interaction energy on this axis, and there's a chemical potential divided by interaction energy on this axis. This is a zero disorder, and there are these superfluid and modinsulator regions, right? So I think most people know about this. Right? And kind of what they're showing here with this vertical line is that the experiments, because of the trap, you know, one way to think about what the trap is doing is it trap samples a range of chemical potentials that are present. There's a center of the gas, a high density, all the way out to the edge. And when I draw this phase diagram, I usually like to have the chemical potential come down and be negative for the vacuum. So I would like to think of it coming down to the vacuum, which lies down here somewhere. All right, so what happens if you add disorder? Well, we, we know, at least qualitatively, what happens. We know that um, in between uh, all the, you know, a new phase appears called this Bose glass phase, all right, which kind of eats up the modinsulator and eats up part of the superfluid. And this Bose glass phase, one way to think about it is kind of a bunch of disconnected superfluid pulse, all right, and it's generated by disorder. And then eventually, if it's strong enough disorder, we believe in most cases that this whole thing just turns over to superfluid and Bose glass. All right, so the qualitative features of this phase diagram are, are known in 2D and 1D, we know quantitatively, in 3D we know something. We don't know for a very wide range of chemical potentials what happens for disorder in 3D, um, but we know a lot. Okay, so people want to investigate this starting early with Angushio's group on, um, you know, is this picture right? What can we learn about it quantitatively? Um, what happens in experiments when we have these strong interactions present? I should also just say now that, um, you know, for a long time there's been concern or questions about whether or not this kind of Bose glass phase is really only a zero temperature phase. But we actually know now from work by one of David Severly's students, Ushin Shrey, um, who's tucked some data into this paper, that, that this Bose glass phase actually persists up to non zero temperature. So it's something which is not just a zero temperature phenomenon. So we know that in 3D at least now is true. Okay, so the pic this picture does not change qualitatively for a low but non zero temperature. Okay, so how did people do this? So one way people did it was Angushio's group did experiments with their incommensurate lattice, and I stole another picture from one of their papers here, which shows some of the Vanny orbitals that are, that are present in this system, just because I thought that was cute to look at. So now they use potassium 39 atoms, but they don't turn off the interactions with the Feshbach resonance. They allow the particles to be interacting. All right, to have some non-zero scattering line. So what this realizes is an interacting Arbery Andre model. All right, so now I've written things in a different way. I'm sorry, um, but anyways, you're, you're all smart. There's a tunneling term which I talked about yesterday. There's this disorder term which comes from the weak incommensurate lattice. All right, I didn't put that phase offset in here that time. There's an interaction term. This comes from having two particles on one side, and then I wrote the trapping term in um, explicitly here. There's a harmonic trap. Okay, does that make sense to everybody what this is? This is the model they realize and study. Again, this is kind of incommensurate lattice, so it's not disorder in the usual sense. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here, and maybe I'll do a little, take a little bit more time about as you can understand things around. There's a, okay, so this paper is a 2014 paper. They have papers on this going back a bunch of years. But this paper, which doesn't have a lot of new data in it, it's a nice paper to look at for all the different types of measurements that people do. These are kind of all on this paper. So I thought I'd pull this paper out and show you the measurements they did on the system to try to observe what's happening and whether the system localizes or not when the interactions are present. It's got everything in it. And it's, I think this paper has a nice theory by Terry Giamarchi in it as well, which is kind of the new thing in there. So now what's going to happen is um, it's not going to be a diffusion or expansion experiment anymore because you don't want to let the atoms go. If you want the interactions, you don't want the atoms to go. If you want the interactions to play a strong role, you need the atoms to be on top of each other, right? So you're not going to let the atoms go. You're going to keep them trapped. You're going to leave the trap on, and you're going to do some other kind of measurement, not a diffusion measurement, to try to probe localization here. Because if you turn the trap off and the atoms start just expanding away, this interaction term would not play any kind of role anymore because the density would get too low very quickly. 